message series looking at the Old Testament prophet of Elisha. And so we missed last week. Uh, we talked about burning clouds and kind of leaving behind anything that would keep us from moving forward and uh, moving toward God when we have what He has in store for us. We talked about burning clouds. Today we're going to talk about digging ditches. It sounds like a lot of manual labor, but that's just we're going to talk about digging ditches. And so I want to remind you again this message series is uh, based on a book by Stephen Furtick called Greater. It's a wonderful book. If you ever track it down and want to read it, it's a good book. And it, it really catalogs the whole life of Elisha and how he uh, used his faith to serve God. So it's really exciting. But uh, we know that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so today, we're going to dive in and look at uh, how we can have ridiculous faith in God and how we can serve Him in that way. So I wonder how many of you have ever played the If Only game. It's not a real game, but it's something we do in our life on a very regular basis. I'm like, well, if only this or that, my life would be better. My life would be easier. I would have more money or I'd be happier. How many of you ever played that game? The if only game. Just about everybody, except Gary. Gary hasn't played. <laughs> but no, we, uh, we sit around and we say, well, you know, if only I had a better job. Or if, if only I had more money. Or if only I had more hair. Or if only I had hair in the right place. Not here, not here, but up here. Yeah, Paul's back there going, I'm in good shape, man. I look good. Um, so yeah, uh, maybe a lady would say, if only I had a husband. Or maybe a married lady would say, if only I had a husband who had a job. Or maybe she'd say, if only I had a husband who had a job that looked like Brad Pitt. Right? Yeah, so we, we like to play the if only game. I don't know what your if only would be, but throughout life we all kind of recognize that uh, we have needs and we tend to think if only I had, you know, whatever it is, that need would be met and, and life would be so much better. And so today I want to encourage you to listen to this message through the lens of your greatest need. Whatever the greatest need in your life is, and that's different for everybody, but whatever your greatest need is, experience the teaching of God's word through that lens of your greatest need. And it's my prayer that God would minister to you in a very special way. And uh, we're going to kind of set the context of the message for today, and then we're going to take a look at how we can apply God's word to your life. The context for our study today, we're going to see that there were three kings. They didn't come from the east. These are three different kings. Um, that joined forces to do battle against the Moabites. Doesn't matter who the Moabites are for today's study, but we had three kings, three kingdoms going up against one, the Moabites. Should have been a slam dunk. It should be easy. They'll have a very decisive victory, but often, as is with life, things do not go as planned. Amen? Amen. Yeah. And so um, you think you got it all figured out, you know, and then oops. Something happens, something changes, something happens that we didn't expect, and things do not turn out the way that we expect. And that's what happened with these three kings. Uh, instead of winning easily, they find their troops marching around in the desert for seven days, and uh, then they realize that they're totally and completely out of water. And they're on the verge of dying of thirst, and all their animals are about to die of thirst, and they think all hope is lost. They have a very significant need, uh, as many of us do. And so this story is going to teach us uh, this principle, and it's going to be hopefully good news to many of you. Uh, this is the principle for today. Your greatest need becomes a blessing when it drives you to depend on God. That's kind of a funny way to think about it. I hope that is good news for, for many of you, and I'll say it again just so you can kind of get it in your head. Your greatest need becomes a blessing when it drives you to depend on God. So if you're going to hear the word of God today through the lens of your greatest need, think about what that need is, and if you can figure out a way for that need to drive you to God, that's a blessing to be closer to God. And so we're going to read the text, um, and then in light of the very powerful truth, we will figure out how that applies to our lives. So here is 2 Kings chapter 3, starting at verse 9. So the king of Israel set out with the king of Judah and Edom, those are your three kings, after a roundabout march of seven days, the army had no more water for themselves or for the animals with them. They're in trouble. Verse 10, what, exclaimed the king of Israel, has the Lord called us three kings together only to deliver us into the hands of the Moabites? 
In other words, we thought we would win easily, but now it looks like we're going to be destroyed. But Jehoshaphat, one of the kings, asked, Is there no prophet of the Lord here through whom we may inquire of the Lord? An officer of the king of Israel answered, Elisha, son of Shaphat, is here. He used to pour water on the hands of Elijah. Now, if you missed last week, Elijah mentored Elisha. And if you know about the prophet Elijah, when the nation was in a great drought, he called on God, and God sent rain from a cloud that started the size of a hand and brought about one of the biggest storms from the smallest clouds. And so they're thinking, wow, if Elijah could do that, and the word of the Lord is with Elisha, he ought to be able to help us out. And so the king of Israel and, and Jehoshaphat, the king of Edom, go to Elisha. Now, let's make sure we all know what's going on here. The three kings are going to battle against the Moabites, and they're going uh, to win easily, but they do not, and they find themselves in danger, and they're out of water. Now, what you may not know about the three kings is that they were not serving God. You know, typically when we hear king of Israel, king of Judah, we're thinking, oh, they, they must be worshiping God. But this was one of those periods of their downtime, and they were being disobedient to God, and they were uh, kind of worshiping some false gods, and... Uh, so these three kings come together and they end up in trouble and what they do they do what a lot of us do they're like uh, oh yeah God uh, we're in trouble can you help us out and, and they say you know is there anybody here that's really in good with God you know I'm not following God but maybe there's somebody that's like really in good with God and, and we'll go to them and, and maybe they do a little rain dance they do some of their spiritual things and, and you know oh yeah well there's Elisha and you know he's a prophet and maybe he can help us out right and, and so we do that a lot. You know, we, we don't go to church on a regular basis, and, and you know, we're not praying or reading our Bible on a regular basis, but when something bad happens, when we have a need, that's when we run to God, or that's when we run to our friend that that's goes to church all the time. They're like, hey, can you pray for me? That's exactly what these kings are doing. They're like going to Elijah, hey, can you pray? Can you, can you talk to God and figure out how this is going to work out? And, and you know, surely they had heard of the miracles that Elisha had been doing. You know, he's in his rookie year as a prophet, but he's already separated the Jordan. You know, that's impressive. He divides the Jordan River. Uh, another time, there was a, a spring of water that was polluted, and everybody was drinking it and getting sick, and, and he, he spoke to the water, and he healed the water, and people were then able to drink from it, and it was healthy, and it was good. And, and there, there was another time that he's walking from one city to another. He's walking down the road, and these two young boys come up, and they, they start making fun of him, because apparently, I guess, Elisha didn't have a lot of hair, and so the, these two young boys are going, hey, baldy, baldy, and Elisha loses his cool, and he summons two bears out of the woods, and the bears destroy the boys. This is in your Bible. I'm not making this up. It's in there. You, you need to read your Bible, um, and you should also never make fun of a bald guy because you don't know how much faith he has and how close a bear is. Amen. Okay. So just don't do that. But so they go to Elisha and they're like, hey, Elisha, can you help us out? And so what do you think Elisha is going to do? Well, let me tell you what he's going to do. He actually cops an attitude with these guys. And he says, okay, let me, let me get this straight. I, I, I think I got it, boys. You, you want to ignore God all this time, but when you're in trouble, you want some God action. And, and he gets pretty smart with these guys and he cops this attitude and he says, I look at it and I say, well, you know, where did Elisha learn to be like that? You know, you would think, holy man, you know, godly man, he's going to respond. Oh, yeah, this, this is what I do for you. I saw, I was curious, and I, I realized, I remembered that Elijah, his mentor, one time went up against 450 false prophets. These false prophets were worshiping the false god of Baal. And Elijah goes and says, okay, well, let's have this little contest. We're going to see whose god is real and whose god actually has power. And so he says, we're going we're to get two bowls, you kill one, I kill one, and we're going to build altars, and, and you put your bowl on your altar, and I'll put my bowl on my altar, but we're not going to start a fire. Yeah, that's what you would normally do with a sacrifice. We're going to call on our gods to start the fire. And if your God does and my God doesn't, we'll worship your God. But if my God does and your God doesn't, then you guys need to worship my God. And they go, okay, yeah, we can do this. And so Elijah says, okay, let's do this, bring it on. And so these false gods, they get their bowl, they put it on the altar, and they start calling to their God, and they say, send the fire, send the fire. And, and of course, nothing happens because Elijah knows what's going to happen, and their God is powerless. And uh, so Elijah is kind of sitting back, and he's kind of laughing at these guys. And then he starts to make fun of them. He says, come on. 
You know, maybe you should shout louder. Maybe your God can't hear you. Maybe he's deaf. Or maybe he's on vacation. And he says, well, maybe your God has taken a nap and you need to wake him up. This, it's, this is real. It's in the Bible. Now, it, and this is the fun part. If you read the contemporary English version, that's not a popular translation, but if you read the contemporary English version, Elijah actually says this. Maybe your God is daydreaming or maybe he's in the toilet. This is in the Bible. You, you, I can't make this stuff up. So he said, maybe your God's in the bathroom, and that's why he can't send the fire. And of course, you know, it never happens in Elijah. You know, Elijah actually pours water all over his altar like three times, and then God creates fire, and so he wins that battle. So we have Elisha, which is just doing what Elijah did. He's getting an attitude. He's making fun of these guys. And so he says in verse 13, Elisha says to the king of Israel, why do you want to involve me? Now, you guys have been ignoring God all this time. Why do you want to involve me? Go to the prophets of your fathers. Go to the prophets of your mother. And he says, you know, call the prophets of your mother. And no, the king of Israel answered, because it was the Lord who called us three kings together to deliver us into the hands of Moab. And Elisha said, and, and now he's going to be smart again. He says, watch this. As surely as the Lord Almighty lives, whom I serve, you know, he's got to get his little dig in there. As surely as the Lord Almighty lives whom I serve, if I didn't have respect for Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I would not pay attention to any of you. But because Jehoshaphat is here, I've decided to help you out. You need a prophet, I'm your prophet. And then in verse 15, he makes a demand. And he says, but now, and you would expect that this would be like where he would do his miracle and bring the water. He says, but now, bring me a harpist. Okay, if you want me to prophesy, I need some moon music. Go get me a harpist. Go get the biggest, most difficult instrument you can find to move and bring it here and bring me a good player and give me some music and, and I'll prophesy. Now, that's kind of humorous. We, we think that might even be a little bit demanding. But the reality of it is this was not entirely uncommon for prophets of the Old Testament to do. There's just something about uh, you know, the way you worship God when there's music along with it. And that's why we have music in our meetings, so that we can use that as an avenue to praise God and, and you know, he can inhabit the praises of his people. If you're a follower of Christ, you understand that you know, there's just something special about the way the heart drifts toward him in praise and worship and adoration. And so that's what Elisha does. He's, he says, you know, bring me music, play the harp. And so the three kings, you know, they go, okay, we're going to do that. They go and, and, and get the harp and they're expecting a word of encouragement. You know, God is going to send us the rain. Uh, I can feel the music playing. This is going to be good. And what does he do? Does he bring them a word of encouragement? No, he gives them a ridiculous command. Verse 15 and 16. Then it happened when the music played, uh, then the hand of the Lord uh, came upon him and he said, Thus says the Lord. And again, depending on your version, uh, it may say the valley will be full of water. But New King James says, Make this valley full of ditches. Well, wait a minute. I thought God was just going to like give us water out of nowhere. You know, we'd take our shoes off, we'd run around, we'd dance in the rain, we'd have a good time, right? That's not the plan. And so these kings probably look at Elijah and says, you're telling me that while my troops are dying of thirst, you want them to go out and do manual labor in the hot desert sun? And Elisha probably goes, yep, that's what I want you to do. And uh, so he says, go and dig some ditches. Make this valley full of ditches. There's no sign of rain anywhere. They're in the middle of a severe drought. But yes, I want you to go dig some ditches. And so, again... Sometimes your greatest need can be a blessing when it drives you to depend on God. And so that's basically what's happening with the king. They have to depend that Elisha knows what he's talking about. Depend that God will actually do something positive. So verse 17. For this is what the Lord says. You will see neither wind nor rain. Yet this valley will be filled with water and you, your cattle, and your other animals will drink. Verse 18, and this this is where Elisha just lays it right out on the line. This is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. In other words, you have no idea how powerful, how mighty, how strong our God is. At the snap of a finger, our God can do this. It's an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. And oh, by the way, you know that thing that you wanted, that other thing? Yeah, we're going to take care of that too. God will deliver Moab into your hands. But first, I want you to dig some ditches. So that's the context of our story. That's, that's what we're going to focus on today. That's, that's the biblical portion of, of what we're going to look at today. And what I want to do with the rest of the time that we have together um, 
is just figure out how do we take that idea, this idea that we need to dig ditches, and apply it to our life. Because I'm thinking nobody here digs ditches for a living or probably spends much time doing it at all. So how do we translate that into contemporary America, and how, do, how does that apply to our life? What does it mean for today? Well, if we were to subtitle just today's message, it would be faith that works. You know, the Bible says, you know, faith without works is dead. That comes right out of James. Um, but, you know, faith... That works, And there's kind of an intentional play on words there because we talk about faith that works, faith that is effective, you know, it, it works. Um, and so, in other words, faith that moves the heart of God and invokes a response from God. It's a faith that works. At the same time, we're talking about a faith that is not only effective, but also a faith that is active, a faith that does something, faith that works, a uh, faith that so uh, believes that God is going to act, that, that we act. And we take a step toward God, believing that God is going to take a step toward us. You know, kind of a meet in the middle thing, but we have to take that first step. And so we're going to do two principles. I know everybody's taking notes, so as, as you write them down, these are two principles. Uh, the first one uh, is, is really good. I don't think you're going to be able to contain yourself when I share it with you, because I can tell you guys are right on the edge of your seats. Only God can send the water, but sometimes you need to dig a ditch. Only God can send the water. We don't have the power to do that on our own. Only God can send the water, but sometimes we need to dig a ditch first. And so, like I said, right out of James, just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without works. Only God can send the water, but sometimes he wants to see our faith. He wants to see us dig a ditch. Do you really think that the God of the universe needs us to dig a ditch? He doesn't need us to do anything. God can do anything. You know, God can be just like, okay, ditches everywhere, ditches here, ditches there, ditches everywhere, lakes, oceans, water, everybody's happy, right? But instead, it's almost as if he's saying, you show me your faith, and I will show you my faithfulness. You kind of take that first step, and then I'll show you how powerful and awesome I really am. You show me your faith, I'll show you my faithfulness. Because in truth, God loves to see our faith. He loves to see us do things that prove we believe. So all over the New Testament you see this. The Bible will say, when Jesus saw their faith. Think about all the miracles that Jesus did, especially you know, the one-on-one miracles. You know, it all often starts out, when Jesus saw their faith, or when Jesus knew that they believed. Um, so if I'm praying, do you see my faith? Is it like you walk in and you see me praying, and you're like, oh, look at that faith steam rising off of his brain. You know, he's obviously, he's got great faith. It doesn't really happen that way, right? So what am I talking about when I say see faith? You don't see that, but you see faith in action. When Peter was on the boat and, and said, Jesus, if that's you, tell me to come and I'll come. And Jesus says, come. And Peter jumps out of the boat and he walks on water. You see his faith. And the other 11 disciples, you didn't see that same faith. But this guy got out of the boat and you saw his faith. And I believe that there are many times that God you know, wants to see us participate in his miracles. It's still his miracle, but he wants to see us participate in his miracles. And, and again, throughout the, the Bible and the New Testament, you know, we see this. There's a guy with a withered hand. And what does Jesus do with the guy with the withered hand? What does he ask him to do? Do you remember? He says, reach out your hand. Jesus doesn't just go, okay, poof, fine, you're healed. He says, no, reach out your hand. Show me that you believe. Just give me that little bit of faith, and I'll heal your hand. You know, another time in the Bible, there's a guy who couldn't walk for years and years. His whole life, he couldn't walk. And Jesus goes to him and says, sir, get up. Pick up your mat and walk. He doesn't just go poof. Jesus doesn't pick him up and, like, help him along. He says, no, I need you to take a step. And the guy very easily could have said, I know you think you're special and all, but I can't walk. I can't get up. I've been an invalid my whole life. But he doesn't do that. You know, God says, or Jesus says, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And the guy does it because he has faith. God says, I want to see that you have faith and believe that what I say is true. And he says, get up. Only God can send the water, but sometimes you have to dig a ditch. The blind guy, the blind guy that Jesus heals, what does Jesus do? You know, he picks up some dirt and he spits in it and he rubs it together. He makes mud and he puts it on the guy's eyes. I didn't expect an amen. I expected, ooh, that's gross. (laughs) But what does he do then? He says to the guy, okay, you know, go and wash your eyes in the pool of Siloam. In other words, 
I've done my part. You know, I want to see you do yours. You show me your faith, I'll show you my faithfulness. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. I think there's too many people that are just like, you know, know, I'm waiting for God to show me his faithfulness. But they're not showing God any faith. You take a step of faith. You want to, let's say you want to quit smoking. You know, maybe this is your step of faith. On the way out the door today, you throw away all your cigarettes and you don't buy anymore. You know, that's a step of faith. That's a huge step of faith. You know, that, that would be crazy. But that's what we're talking about. We're talking about ridiculous faith. Maybe you just throw them away and, and never, never touch them again. Maybe you want to heal a relationship. Maybe you got a, a bad relationship with a family member or, or, or somebody. And, and maybe you need to forgive that person before they ever ask for forgiveness. Maybe you need to show them love when all they're doing is being ugly to you. You know, that's faith. That's you digging a ditch. I know a lot of people that say, that'll say, oh, you know, I want my kids to serve Jesus and, and be a good Christian. But they don't bring their kids to church. You know, maybe they send them with somebody else, but they're not being an example. You know, they're never praying as a family. They're never reading the Bible to their kids, and they expect God to do something. You got you to gotta dig a ditch. You got to do something. People say, I want more money. You know, I want more money. Christians, all the time. You know, they say, I want more money, but they don't tithe. You know, some of you are great at tithing. Some of you, not so good. And and this is another one of those crazy, ridiculous principles. God gives us this ridiculous principle that if we give him our first, if we give him our best, then he'll bless the rest. And so God says, we understand that if you are a tither, if you're a Christian and you tithe regularly, you understand that God can do way more with 90% that has his blessing than 100% that doesn't have his blessing. Amen? Amen. Sometimes you got to dig a ditch. You feel like you need more, you got to give something to God first. So, single guys, I'm bummed that John's not here today. Single guys, you're like, oh man, I want a wife, I want a wife. We'll just use Greg as an example. I want a wife. Give me a wife. But you're sitting on your butt, you're not doing anything, waiting for some wonderful, attractive woman to come knock on your door with a Bible in her hand saying, take me to church or lose me forever. And God is looking at you saying, brush your teeth, iron your shirt, sell your Xbox, move out of your mom's basement, get a full-time job, buy some flowers, ask somebody out. Only God can send the babe. Sometimes you got to brush your teeth. Okay? Maybe that's how that applies to you today. Only God can send the water, but sometimes you got to dig a ditch. Second principle, again, if you're taking notes, real faith, real faith, not pretend faith, like, hey, I read the Bible, so I'm a Christian. Real faith believes big, but starts small. And we touched on this last week a little bit when we talked about the soup kitchen. Real faith believes big, but is willing to start small. I know too many people who call themselves Christians that aren't thinking big enough. We serve an awesome, amazing God that can do exceedingly and abundantly more than we can ever ask or imagine or dream up on our own. we got to think big. We we serve a big God. And I know just as many who won't think big, who at the same time aren't willing to start small. You know, they think we we have to do it all, all at once. You know, we got to start small. So think about this. How do you dig a ditch? If you're in the ninth century, how do you dig a ditch? You've probably got some kind of shovel, some kind of tool, but you're doing it one scoop at a time. You know, today we just bring in a big back hole, boom, big ditch, done. But back then, man, one one scoop at a time, you're starting small. And you're not going to see a lot of evidence right away, but as you and your friends get together and you spend more time, you know, you dig a ditch. But you start small. Now, I know that many of you have spent time this week reading from the book of Zechariah. Yeah? Everybody read from Zechariah? Okay, no. So I'm going to read just a little bit from Zechariah to you. Chapter 4, verse 10. Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. Wonderful example out of the book of Zechariah. When we did construction on this building, you know, I think we're at a point now where we're starting to get comfortable in the building and we're kind of getting used to where everything is, but when my wife and I was, were appointed here in 2012... You know, we were already a year into the process of the youth education town, and we'd gotten the money, but we hadn't really done anything physical to the building, and it was a long time getting started. But man, 
the day that they came in and started <clears throat> to tear down that playground, that's where our lobby is now, that was a huge day for me. I was so excited because <clears throat> even though it was small and nobody would see it from the street and there was going to be another five months before anything else happened, that was the beginning. It was a small beginning. It was a beginning, and I was excited. And that's how God is with small beginnings. You know, when we begin to take a journey with him and we start small, he loves that. So you have to start small. There may be some of you, you got a big vision, and you don't have a clue where you're going to start. You've got to start small. You just start with whatever's right there in front of you. You've got to be faithful with what God has given you. You start small, and he will do amazing things. So you know that we have a son that has special needs. And this is, this is a great story. It's a true story. There's a, there's a lady named uh, Savannah uh, that was part of a mega church, <clears throat> and she saw this family that really struggled uh, to, really just to go to church, to be at church, because they had a child with special needs, and, and there were just complications. And the church, quite frankly, just didn't have the ability to have this family in the church. There was, it was just too difficult. And so these families, you know, there's a lot of them that either don't go to church, or, you know, they can't go together, they have to go separately, or, or, you know, it's just a challenge. My wife and I have met many people who have family members with special needs that struggle to get to church simply because the church has trouble accommodating that need. And so Savannah thought someone needs to do something about this, and she wanted to make a big difference because she understood there's a lot of people like this, um, but she didn't know how to make a big difference. She didn't know how to start a whole, like, nonprofit and do all this stuff or start her own church or anything, and so she said, you know, what can I do to start small. And so she found one family in her church that had a child with special needs and said, what can I do to help you so that you can go to church together? And she basically became part of this family. And people saw what she was doing, and they, and they said, you know, I'd like to do that as well. And, and the families with children similar to this, they know each other, they talk to each other, and so they were able to kind of create a group. And today in that church, there are 50 people serving 50 families so that they can be part of the church family because one person was willing to start small. So how do you start something big? You start small. Hendersonville, Tennessee is a story. There's a guy named Richard, another true story. Uh, Richard weighed a little over 400 pounds. I think he was almost approaching 450 pounds. And the doctor said to Richard, if you don't lose weight, you're never going to have a kid. You're, you're probably not going to make it out of your 30s. You've got horrible health. You need to lose weight. And this is far enough back, they didn't have all the, the techniques today that kind of help with that. And so Richard decided to go to church. That was, he thought, well, you know, maybe there's something there that can help me overcome this challenge that I have in my life. And so Richard decided to go to church, but he gets to the parking lot and he gets very nervous because he doesn't want to go in because he sticks out and he's afraid of how people will look at him and, and whether or not anybody will talk to him. He gets very self conscious. And so while he's sitting there in the parking lot, he hears this, this voice inside that says, I can't fix your outside until you let me fix your inside. And just that little voice was enough to get Richard to get up and walk into that church. And Richard gave his life to Christ, and God started doing work on his inside. And Richard went home, and after binge eating an entire box of cereal, he put in a workout DVD, and he did one workout. And the next week, he did one workout. And over time, that kind of became two workouts a week, and then eventually it turned into four workouts a week, and then he, he decided to start doing CrossFit, which... If you know what that is, that terrifies me. I don't even want to try and do it. Uh, he, does, he does CrossFit. He enters a CrossFit competition that has a $100,000 first prize. And not only does he win, he lost 184 pounds in 18 months. Or I'm sorry, he, he weighed 184 pounds. So he lost about 220 pounds in only 18 months. And so here's this guy that needed a big change in his life. That was definitely his greatest need, but he was willing to start small. He didn't know how to lose all that weight. But he said, you know, maybe there's something in church that can, that can get me in the right place. He started small. Now Richard travels the United States as kind of a motivational speaker. And he talks to other people about how they can do really big things by starting small. He talks about the love of Jesus and how Jesus had an impact on his life. And so I want to encourage you to think big, but always be willing to start small. So, you know, maybe you've been struggling to find a job and, you know, you want to have a great job. And you want to, you know, you want to wear a suit and drive a car and, you know, do these things. But you don't know where to start. Start small. Figure it out. You know, figure out what that one thing you need to do is to start that ball rolling and let the momentum take you where you want to go. Because if you're willing to start small, God will send the water. You know, you dig a ditch, God will send the water. You just say, God, I believe you can do it. And then start where you are. God loves it when we participate in his miracles. And we can see our faith because faith without works is dead. 
Verse 20 of 2 Kings chapter 3 says this. The next morning, about the time of the offering of the sacrifice, you ready? There it was. All the water that they needed. It was right there. After they faithfully dug the ditches, the Bible says water was flowing from the direction of Eden and the land was filled with water. Because God showed his faithfulness after they showed their faith. These three kings so easily could have walked away discouraged, saying, man, we can't dig ditches. We're exhausted. We don't have any water. We don't have time. You know, this is ridiculous. This is not going to work. But they showed their faith. They said, we believe you, Elisha. We believe in your God, and we're going to dig the ditches. And it worked. Some of you right now, you've got a significant need in your life. And you think, if only, if only God would meet that need. If only God would answer that prayer. But don't ever forget that your biggest need can be a blessing when it drives you to depend on God. You show your faith, He will show you His faithfulness. You've got to believe big, start small. I pray that we have a a church family, a family of of God who will think big and start small and, and, and have the faith that we need. That when there's not a cloud in the sky, that we'll have the water we need because God is faithful. And as we get ready to pray today, you know, we're not going to have any music. Um, but, you know, we're going we're gonna to pray together. We're going to give you time. Because I want to know, or I'm wondering, you know, how many of you are at a moment in your life when you're facing a significant need? You know, maybe you prayed this morning about something very specific. You know, if that's you, just by faith, this is your time to step forward. Step forward in faith. You walk to this altar, you have a conversation with God, you ask God for help, and maybe he'll tell you what that ditch is. He'll tell you what that one thing is he needs to get started. Maybe, maybe, maybe just coming forward is you digging a ditch. Maybe you show in the faith that I trust you, God, I'm going to walk forward to this altar and pray. Maybe that's digging your dick. It's ditch. It's not a huge task. You just need to start small. Show your faith and get up and walk down to this altar. That small step of faith today could turn into a ridiculous amount of faith tomorrow or maybe next week or or next year. But you have to start small and and you have to start now. So I say there's not going to be any music. Now is the time. If you want to come forward, now is the time. I'm going to talk for just one more minute and then we'll pray. Uh, But as we pray this morning, I I want to share one more thing. If you want to talk about digging a ditch, if you want to talk about faith, you want to talk about doing something before you know what the results are going to be, I've got to talk about what God did and showing you the greatest example of love in the history of mankind. Because while we were still sinners, that's what the Bible says, you know, you know, while we least deserved it, while we're still mocking God, living our lives one way, living outside of God's plan, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God sent his son to die on our behalf, to take the punishment. You know, Jesus was sinless. He never sinned. He was the perfect sacrifice for the forgiveness of our sins. And on the third day, uh, the stone was rolled away and the tomb was empty and Jesus rose. And Scripture says, Now whoever calls on the name of the Lord, and that includes you, no matter who you are, no matter where uh, you've come from, what you've done, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What does that mean? That means forgiven. God will never hold your sins against you. You're adopted into this family of God. You become a child of God. And what do you acquire with that status? It's not... You know, it's, it's nothing about works. You want to acquire that status, it's only about faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. You know, you can be made right with God by His grace through faith. So for some of you, it's time to put your faith in God. It's time to show your faith. Believe that Jesus was enough because of His life and His death and His resurrection. You know, there may be somebody here that says, that's me, I need that grace, I need his forgiveness. Well, today, by faith, take a step forward. All you got to do is come to this altar, and someone will walk you through a prayer of salvation, and you can stand up in this place as a new man, as a new woman, in Christ Jesus. God can do that because of faith. And so as, as we pray, as others pray, I'm going to pray over us, and we'll just close out our time here this morning. Lord, you're an awesome God. And you can do amazing things. I pray that you would build the faith of this congregation. You know, for those that are Christians, Lord, I pray that you would increase their faith. And, uh, you know, as that happens, I know that your grace will increase in their life. But, Lord, for those that maybe are outside of what we call Christianity or they just, you know, don't understand Jesus or don't believe in Jesus yet, I pray that you would give them faith. 
You know, start small with them. Just give them that first inkling of faith that they could grow up in Christ, that they could learn who you are and what you've done for them so that as they start small, they could grow into something big and awesome and amazing that would glorify you. Lord, I pray that you would build our faith corporately as a, as a congregation, that you grow our faith individually so that we'd be something different than what everybody else is, that we would be you know, servants of you, we'd be your children, and that our faith would be evident, it would be active, people would see it, and that they would want to know more about it, because if we keep our faith secret, if we stay at home and we read our Bible and pray, but we don't do anything out in public that people understand what our faith is and what it looks like, then we can't impact other people, and you've called us to spread your gospel to all the corners of the world, Lord. And so we have to take this, this faith that you've given us. And if we're Christians, you know, we've seen your faithfulness and we've experienced your faithfulness in our lives. And the next step for us is to con- continue to live out that faith in our daily lives so that people see it and go, hey, what, what's different about you? Or, you know, why do you believe? Maybe they, they know we believe and they know we're a Christian, but they've never been prompted to ask why. And maybe it's because our faith is not ridiculous enough. Maybe we say, oh, yeah, I believe God, but then we keep doing all the things that we did before we believed in God. Maybe they don't see the difference. So, Lord, I pray right now that as you grow our faith, you would change us into better ambassadors of you, better representatives of you, better children of you, so that when people look at us, they realize, gosh, you know, there is something different, and I see this thing. Maybe they don't know to apply the word faith. Maybe they don't understand you know, why it is we're doing the things or what it is if we're actually doing, but we're doing something different than everybody else so that they want to ask and they want to know and they want to have what we have because what we have is awesome. God's love in our life, the sacrifice of Christ Jesus to take away the punishment of sin is amazing and awesome and we are so fortunate to have that and to experience your love and other people need to feel that. Other people need to know what your love is, God. Other people need to know what it's like to have faith in you and how you can change our lives and you can take us from who we are to something better. Not something perfect, not something that never makes a mistake, or not something that has all the money we ever need, but something better than who and what we are today, Lord. And it's because of faith. It starts with faith. It starts with that small step of faith that allows us to move forward and move towards you. And when we move towards you, you move towards us, and we just keep getting closer and closer, and you keep working in our life and changing us and and helping us to understand who you are and what your love looks like so we can just continue the cycle and then share that with somebody else and share it with somebody else, and then they can experience what we experience. And, Lord, it's an amazing process, and I thank you that you've saved me. I thank you that you've saved those here in this room that are saved, and I just pray that you would continue to save our friends and our family and those that we come in contact every day so that we continue to build your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven so that more people and more people and more people would experience your faith, your awesomeness, and your amazing grace. And so, my friends, if you're here today, you know the song Amazing Grace. Let's just sing together. We don't have any piano, but let's just sing together as we pray for God's amazing grace.